Okay, so I'm going to be talking, giving you a brief update on our research, in ag research, uh, on Californian thistle, and I'm going to end with some best sort of practice guidelines. Californian thistle occurs pretty much throughout pastoral agricultural land in New Zealand now. Uh, according to a recent survey of our, that we've uh, just completed, it's on 97% of sheep farming properties have Californian thistle, and 79% of beef farms have Californian thistle. And as part of this survey, um, we asked farmers uh, how much of their, their grazable area was actually covered by Californian thistle at the peak time of its cover, which is in, in typically in January, February. And the sheep farmers came back and said, uh, on average, 12% of their grazable area in January, February is is, is covered with this weed. Uh, the beef farmers came back and said about 4% on average. So California thistle is actually covering or excluding grazing from quite significant areas on both sheep and beef farms. And, it, and we had some extra data that we could sort of model out and show what the cover would be in the, in the other months of the year. So what you see is sort of, uh, you know, December, January, February, going into March is the period where there are quite high covers. Now, what we're going to do with this data is, try and is build some farm systems models to, for the first time, try and get a handle on just what Californian thistle might be doing to uh, farm profit. So that will be another story. Um, but I want to go on now and talk about the bio a little bit about the biology as we understand it and what you as farmers perhaps need to understand a little bit about in order to best control this plant. So a Californian thistle population is, in a pasture is driven entirely by uh, an aerial shoot population and its production of roots. So this little simple model here shows that um, you've got an aerial shoot population, so many shoots per square metre or on, in, on a paddock. Um, it produces roots and root buds these root buds produce subterranean shoots that come out of the ground in the spring and produce a new crop of aerial shoots. So uh, we have births of shoots. Now, balancing the births every year, we have deaths of shoots. And of course, what happens to the population over time depends on the balance between the births of shoots and the deaths. It's a simple population model. And this is where you as farmers have quite a lot of control in, in, in regulating the, the births of these shoots or the deaths of these shoots uh, through processes like enhancing the competition for the pasture, natural diseases, mowing, grazing, insects, herbicides, those sorts of things can all affect the, the death rate or the number of deaths in a shoot population, which feeds back through to the size of that population. And the size of the population really governs what the scientists would like to call the photosynthetic opportunity. How much photosynthesis can a, a California thistle uh, population uh, generate over a growing season? And that controls how much root it produces, which controls how many new shoots will be produced the following season. Now, I just want to talk a little bit more about this photosynthetic opportunity before we look at some of these processes that we, that we can put in place to try and control a population. So from trials many years ago, we were able to show that photosynthetic opportunity, this is just how much photosynthesis can this population generate over a growing season, um, governs the, ma the mass of root that will be, will be produced over that, over that growing season. So, and we see this as a linear relationship. And so what our control measures ought to be focusing on is pushing this photosynthetic opportunity down this way to reduce the amount of root that's produced. And that goes forward and reduces the number of shoots that will come up next year. So it's quite a simple relationship. And I think when we, as we go through and talk about these various control options, keep thinking about this photosynthetic opportunity. That's what all of our control measures ought to be targeting, winding this back. 
This experiment here was conducted a few years ago at Lincoln, and what we simply did was we sowed, we planted California thistle seedlings into these boxes. Uh, on the left-hand side, we had no pasture, and then we had a typical ryegrass white clover pasture sown in with uh, the California thistle plants. One was grazed short, kept between 20 to 60 millimetres. The next one was grazed a little bit taller, and the final one on the right wasn't grazed at all. And I think you, get, you can clearly see the results of that competition yourself. Um, in the short grazed pasture, the Californian thistle won. By the end of the growing season, the pasture had all but gone. A couple, a couple extra centimetres of, of growth on, that, on the grass throughout the growing season, and the Californian thistle was really screwed back. And when the, when the grass wasn't cut at all in that hay treatment, uh, there was very little Californian thistle left uh, at the end of that season. So this really you know, this shows the, uh, the power, if you like, of competing pasture species and the influence they have on Californian thistle. Californian thistle is not a very good competitor. Um, now, these sort of simple treatments really kind of uh, relate quite directly to grazing management, and there's been quite a lot of work done in Canada in particular. So coming back to the left-hand side here is sort of, uh, is the sort of uh, uh, growth you'd expect under a set stocking, a, a frequent intense grazing regime that would keep eating out the grass, allowing the Californian thistle to grow better, reducing the competition. At the far end, uh, more, it's more akin to a, a long rotation, long spelling period, allowing the grasses and clovers to grow better, to regrow and to compete out, out compete the California thistle. So this is something to think about, the power of the competing uh, pasture, pasture plants uh, against California thistle is something that we can actually manipulate. You've got a lot of control over. Mowing is another way that we can reduce that uh, photosynthetic opportunity. Um, the more regularly uh, a, th a thistle population is mowing, for example, three times per year, November, January and February, you would expect the California thistle population to actually be pretty much uh, eradicated uh, after three years if that was done rigorously for, uh, for three years in a row. Uh, a single mowing can be effective as well, but uh, it seems that the later in the season a single mowing is done, the better. And we think that it's got something to do with the fact that there's a lot of root being produced at that time of the year, so uh, that's when uh, a single mowing has a, a big effect. But it also could be due partly to the fact that there are a lot of fungi out there that are pathogens of California thistle that have their fruiting bodies and their spores being produced late in the season and these uh, pathogens could be spread uh, more effectively with a late mowing as, as compared to an earlier mowing, say, in, in, in January or November. So the mowing is a powerful tool against Californian thistle. And it's even better if it's done in the rain. Now this is a, uh, you know, many farmers have told me over the years that I mowed my Californian thistle uh, in the rain, uh, and it never came back. Well, Beef and Lamb funded a, a series of experiments over two years, and what we were able to show, and these, these are experiments where farmers actually mowed in the rain and mowed under dry conditions. Here's a, an example. Uh, a, the year after the mowing, mown in the wet, you can see the result for yourself on average across the 24 farms. Mowing in the wet, or during wet weather conditions, gave 30% uh, better control of California thistle as compared to mowing in the dry. Now, we think this has got something to do with promoting pathogens. We've got no real evidence yet what pathogens might be involved. We've got some ideas. Um, and if you're interested in this, go to the Ag Research uh, public website, um, go to that URL, and you'll you can, you can see a, vi a short video which tells the story about those, those trials and what we think is going on there. But mowing in the rain certainly does improve the control of this thistle. Okay, um, another way of going that we've been doing some research on is what we call bioherbicides. Um, 
There have been at least 14 fungal pathogens considered throughout the world. None of them have become commercial yet. A bioherbicide is simply a fungus that is applied as a herbicide, but it's, it's a living organism. One we're working on with Canadians is a thing we're calling the pea fungus. You can see uh, quite dramatic effects here at Lincoln against Californian thistle. Uh, we're still uh, developing this idea with the Canadians and it may or may not become a commercial product at some stage. Another option is what we call augmentative biocontrol where we uh, can take a, a naturally occurring uh, disease and give it a bit of a leg up. Now this is the California thistle rust which many of you will, be, will have seen on your property. It's, it's widespread throughout New Zealand. Um, this is a picture here of uh, Dr. Mike Cripps, I think, is in the audience somewhere. Um, we've been looking at how we can augment this pathogen and actually uh, introduce its spores to um, uh, uh, otherwise uh, unaffected uh, thistle populations. And we've had quite a lot of success there. Classical biocontrol is the last, uh, last option, but um, it's probably the one that's most exciting, particularly for, uh, for hill country properties. Um, one of the agents uh, that's recently been released is quite well established now in, in pastures in, in, in the lowland uh, is Cassida rubiginosa, a tortoise beetle. Up there on the left hand side, this thing really decimates California thistle. This picture was taken in Lincoln uh, this season. Um, and it potentially has huge uh, benefits in hill country properties. We like to call it a flying mower. It can fly in there and do the defoliation for us. So I just want to just finish off there and uh, leave some time for um, questions. But I think, you know, in terms of best practice, we need competitive gap free pastures. We need to more lax rotational grazing rather than heavy grazing. One thing I didn't mention was herbicides. There's only four of them on the market. They all damage clover. I think they should be avoided if possible. Um, mow several times a year, mow in the rain, and look out for Cassida. Thanks, Graham. Um, look, that was a good brief update. Has anyone um, got any questions for Graham? A couple, we can take a couple of quick questions on that. Uh, Roundup uh, will give you some control of California thistle. Uh, but not in a pasture situation. But it will get into the roots and give you some sort of temporary control. Um, yeah, well, um, we, um, it's, as far as I know, it's not on hill country properties. It's uh, the California Thistle Action Group who introduced this about five years ago, released it on, I think, about 51 uh, properties throughout sort of Otago, Southland. Um, uh, you can, uh, Mike, are you in, in the audience? No. Yes, ah. but I can't really tell you much more about uh, the locations of it. It's, it is in both the South and North Island. It's established well pretty much every site that it was released. But Right. So, so what we're interested in doing, actually, as a research group, is um, introducing it to some hill country properties. And um, if there's anybody interested in discussing with Mike and I after after this meeting, we'd be only too interested to, to talk with you. Any work done Yeah, many years ago, and you know, I think uh, a Roundup came out as one of the the, the better chemicals for use. But uh, we haven't done anything in recent years. Um, well, though, no, Kerry Harrington, didn't he, at Massey, he had a student, um, actually, just recently, <coughs> correct, yeah, I correct myself, yeah, there has been some work done at, at Massey University, um, at probably about four years ago, it was a PhD study, and they looked at several chemicals, including Roundup, I believe, um, and I think, yeah, there certainly is some value in using a, a weed wiper. You avoid, certainly should avoid that pasture damage, legume damage that you'll get with, with these other chemicals. Last, last question. What sort of abatement are you getting with Cassida? Sorry? What sort of control, how effective is Cassida in the long term? 
That's something, Mike, do you want to address that? What sort of control are we getting with uh, Cassiter? Um, it looks very good, very promising. To be honest, it's something that we need to do research on. We don't really know. The, the simple answer is we don't really know what it's doing to populations in the long run. So in one season, for instance, we can see dramatic defoliation by this beetle. But what does that mean for the next season rebuild? It does certainly look like it could really pull back that photosynthetic opportunity. You know, we got a lot of mortality here at Lincoln uh, in plots that we observed this, 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 this last growing season. So it, it does look very promising. But it needs to be evaluated. And, and the, the, the big benefit will be in the hill country where you can't get tractors and, and you can't get herbicides. So. Thank you, Graham. Uh, You're I'm sure look, it's a subject that affects us all to a certain degree. And um, 97 per cent. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, I'm sure we'll all follow your research uh, with interest over the years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.